Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is David Ciccone, and I'm an associate professor of political science here at George Washington University. Welcome to our Monarch's Eurasia New Voices on Eurasia Speaking Series. For those of you who are newly acquainted with Ponards, we're a network of over 150 academics working on the Eurasian region from a variety of perspectives and located across North America and Europe and Eurasia. Uh, the New Voices on Eurasia Speaking Series has been around for several years and aims to bring the best and the brightest younger voices working on the region um, in economics, political science, anthropology, sociology, across a number of different countries and a variety of different research questions. Today's talk, we're thrilled to have Rikor Nishnika, uh, originally from Belarus, but currently at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Rikor is an incredible scholar of all things Eastern neighborhood, I think I might categorize as. So not just Belarusian domestic politics, but Ukrainian domestic politics, relations with Russia, wartime dynamics, post-wartime dynamics, hopefully um, I relied on his scholarship time and time again to better understand this part of the world and also get a genuinely Belarusian perspective on the days and events. So we're thrilled to have you today to share your thoughts and your latest research and any other policy implications you might have. Just as a reminder, these talks will go around 35 to 40 minutes. I'll kick things off with the first question, and then we'll open it up to questions and answer, question and answers from the audience. So please feel free to have make this a conversation or discussion quite informal. Um, but we're looking forward to hearing what Recor has to say. So thank you so much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you, David, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I always have a problem of saying what actually I'm doing. <laughs> always coming up with different things, but that was actually perfect. I will later watch the recording and repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'll be talking mostly. So thank you for, for actually inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. So many thanks to Poners and the team for actually uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss the topic and also uh, present my research on Belarus. And uh, I'll be mostly focusing today in the next half an hour or so on uh, the consequences of, of the war on, on Belarus. And uh, uh, I will primarily try to look at three major clusters, which I would argue have been always the uh, main pillars of the stability of the Lukashenko's regime, meaning it's uh, relations with the with the society, with the elite, and Moscow. And what I would argue here uh, is, or what would be my my main takeaway, is uh, basically um, something that we will probably discuss, or I'll try to discuss in the Q&A and also towards the end of my discussion, is uh, basically how long this regime can uh, actually stay in power given the new domestic and uh, also external conditions. So uh, what I would say is that since not only the war but also the you know, called double crisis, the double ongoing crisis, meaning the revolution of 2020 and uh, the war, we see the radical shift in the uh, state society relationship, uh, the um, uh, the elite, and as well as the Belarus-Russia relations, which profoundly uh, erodes these pillars of stability and makes the regime profoundly vulnerable. So, having said that, uh, I'll move to the first cluster, which is uh, which is the society and. Uh, <coughs> To, to a large extent, if you look at the, at the scholarship and the discussion of what, uh, what is the uh, puzzle of Lukashenko, how actually Lukashenko and this regime could have been in power for uh, 30 years in a, in a country with quite high level of social capital and what we have seen, see, have seen later, uh, quite uh, modern and Europeanized society. We actually have to say that this regime has been very adaptive in, uh, and, and in a sense, uh, uh, trying to follow up to 
a large extent of the development that is happening in Belarusian society since 1990. So what we have seen up till 2020 is a sort of an evolution from uh, what has been originally put as social contract, fueled obviously by Russian money, to what Andrew Wilson said was uh, a security contract. Uh, and uh, in a sense, this kind of a, has been uh, accompanied also with the change in uh, states or regimes uh, relations with uh, civil society and the way how actually the regime has been uh, approaching its uh, nation building policy. So what we have seen for the most of the 2010s, and this is quite crucial, is that um, while uh, the society has been more and more Europeanizing, modernizing, the regime actually has been moving behind that. So what we actually could see, and we can always go back and discuss the role of Russia and how the regime felt threatened, but nevertheless, the regime was kind of a following now the societal development. So when we have seen this grassroots bottom-up turn to uh, what was called national awakening, turn to the uh, interest and then you know reliance on national um, kind of identity within the society, Lukashenko quickly endorsed that. And this also has been accompanied with the, the partnership with the Belarusian uh, civil society in, I would say, uh, in domestic affairs. So what actually has been the case during the thousand tens was that the regime was actually quite uh, efficient in co-opting this uh, grassroots civil society and actually diverting its, uh, um, its actually uh, collective, or basically diverting, the, managing this collective action into taking this into, into a state resource. So actually they uh, obviously banned still the political side of it, but all type of uh, political activities has been endorsed, supported, and made a part of a uh, basically um, uh, part of a state. So uh, these activists uh, have been sometimes substituting uh, certain state functions. And this uh, has been very much uh, resonating with uh, what I would say a growing consensus between uh, society and, uh, and, the, and the regime on what should be uh, uh, like Belarus national idea. Although this was very very vague and unclear and never been clearly formalized, but the, the, the consensus that has been for, formed up till 2020 was centered on the idea of national independence and sovereignty. So in this respect, um, I would say uh, Lukashenko has been quite adaptive and his regime's own rhetoric moved from uh, like Belarus being the cradle of Slavic civilization to, to a large extent, uh, Belarus as a citadel of uh, both European and Russian values. And what his own ideologies would put, that Belarus is actually uh, the better part of two worlds. So it actually has better European values, the right ones, but also the better Russian ones. And then that actually Belarus was never uh, was never Russia, so they have two separate countries, so total rewriting of uh, Belarusian history, basically the regime discovered Belarusian history uh, in, in 2010s. Uh, the, the problem is that the revolution which came to, so to a surprise to the regime totally uh, aborted these developments and actually reverted them uh, sort of backwards. So what they actually could say is that the mass uprising that we've seen in 2020, and which was primarily based on um, on this growing gap between archaic regime, which was still governing by uh, the 1990s methods, with this uh, modernizing country, modernizing society, this has been um, this has been this gap basically triggered through. COVID, through the way how the government dealt with that, through the elections, into, into a massive uprising which then to this sort of a type of a uh, state societal relationship and the regime had no way to substitute it other than offer a mass wave of repression. So the repressions became the cornerstone of state society relationships in 2020 and 
this has been very well indicated by the numbers because uh, we can actually talk about over 50,000 of uh, documented, and this is the lower bar number of detentions and uh, like ten, uh, over close to 20,000 extremist criminal cases in, in, in the country uh, combined together with the mass emigration in, uh, of, of uh, most proactive parts of the Belarusian society participated in the protests or uh, part of this uh, grassroots mobilization to, to Poland, Lithuania and, and beyond. Uh, and the same comes with the Lukashenko's nation building. So we see that the previous uh, attempt to come together has been aborted and this abortion came together with the total revert towards basically Moscow's uh, preferred option. So in this regard, I would argue what Lukashenko is doing or his regime in Belarus sort of a voluntary to save his uh, uh, to save his regime is uh, is an exaggeration, but to a certain degree similar to what the Russian <coughs> army is doing in Ukraine. So that any type of the uh, what they would call uh, uh, national uh, symbols uh, elements should be destroyed. Uh, and this has been very much kind of a turned uh, towards uh, uh, kind of a, a Zapad or a season type of a ideology from the part of the, of the Belarusian regime. The same coming to the second cluster, the same actually developments we have seen uh, within, the, within the state and uh, also in uh, uh, basically in the relationship between uh, the regime and its own elite. So I will save time not going much into um, what has been uh, before 2020. But I would underline that even if for a long time Lukashenko followed this uh, uh, maxim that, uh, well, I am the state, uh, this has been sort of a transforming into actually um, it's your state or it's our state. So actually everybody has to chip in and work for the state. And you know, I will give you uh, sort of a chance, even if the system was uh, very centralized, personalized, and Lukashenko uh, had full monopoly and power. Uh, in, in part of the of the regime, at least informally, this has been uh, has been a case. And uh, the same comes with the with the Lukashenko's control over elites. There's been a lot written of how this has been done through rotation, repression, cooptation, obviously. But an important element of this was that. Uh, the, this was fully controlled by him, so in a sense uh, he fully insulated his own elite from any other, especially external influence, and prevented all type of a, um, they are sort of a growing into positions or trying to form some type of within the regime informal uh, coalitions. Uh, this has been massively, uh, massively tented after 2020. So on one hand we see uh, a number of trends, such as uh, uh, illustration of uh, the state bureaucracy, meaning that anyone who has been found sympathetic to the protest or to previous uh, soft bureaucratization and so on and so forth, meaning you are disloyal or anti-Russian, either left voluntarily uh, or they actually have been kicked out. Uh, the state uh, has been undergoing uh, sort of a securitization state, <coughs> meaning that if we can't trust, or if the regime can't trust much uh, the elite around him, he has to really rely on his security forces, meaning that uh, the security personnel or people with a security background would actually fill in positions, key positions from basically uh, Academy of Science to kindergartens. Or universities, so this would be the uh, the major the major trend, uh, and the same comes with their uh, outreach to uh, to other elements of uh, state functions. For instance, we uh, we would see cases where the prosecutor's office would actually start writing textbooks on Belarusian history. Uh, the same comes with the militarization of the state. So we would see that uh, the state would really uh, turn to, this is obviously the 
the day <coughs> after, after the um, uh, Russian invasion and regime's uh, full participation. So again, something that probably I should have started with. We always have to uh, keep in mind that Belarus is all Lukashenko, actually. I would still separate between Lukashenko and the, and the people, something I would come back towards the end. Um, uh, Lukashenko is the only co-aggressor in the war. And uh, we would see that the state would really start this process of militarization of, of, of itself. So we would, uh, we would go to uh, even uh, uh, different types of ideas that the hunter society should actually become the uh, volunteer militia just in case you know, there will be protests. And uh, uh, like who can actually be the ones who uh, will be uh, this type of a, a territorial defense units who would actually support the regime in case there is another type of the uh, volatility and the same coming again uh, stepping into other areas the formation of patriotic classes so in, in, to a certain extent some, some stuff has been definitely borrowed from Russia uh, but what is more important is uh, we do see that the Belarusian elite uh, has been slowly getting its own agency. So, in a sense, uh, we do see that uh, whether before we can say that uh, the regime was really the patron for the elite control, rewarded, etc., we actually have seen the shift where Moscow would grow and it become uh, the major patron for the Belarusian elite. And obviously, this comes with the uh, major transformations of. Uh, not only, uh, again, I mean this a bit later, of Belarus-Russia relations, but also the fact that uh, Belarusian economy has been fully uh, anchored on Russia. So that the trade trade with Russia uh, is, uh, well, Russia is the main market, over 70% of trade, but the caveat is the rest also is dependent on Russia because Belarus and the sanctions has to uh, deliver its or export its goods via Russia again. So we have full full dependence. And uh, uh, and the same comes with the way how Russia would actually uh, promote its uh, specifically economic policies in Belarus. It will actually insist that it's no longer that we have to deliver loans or our uh, contracts uh, or uh, whatever types of benefits via Via Lukashenko, actually, we would like to directly deliver that. So, if uh, anyone like Belarusian railways want to have uh, any type of contracts with Russians, they have to go to Moscow. Uh, the same comes with the uh, any type of regional trade with Russian regions. You know, you Belarusians, uh, uh, officials, Belarusian businessmen have to go to to this to Saint Petersburg or whatever to, to actually. Uh, make this deal directly. Uh, and uh, what is uh, truly important is that, in a sense, we do see also, despite the fact that there is, uh, Lukashenko still denies any type of a uh, dominant party formation or institutionalization of the uh, power sharing among elite, we still, on one hand, see uh, growing fractionalization among the Belarusian elite, and it's uh, Primarily in between two groups, uh, which is uh, uh, basically, I would call them uh, pro regime in a traditional way and uh, uh, radical, uh, sort of a pro Russian uh, uh, new type of a, a elite. And uh, also uh, the question of uh, the new uh, constitutional bodies, which actually have been given tremendous power, but it's unclear how they will be used. Talking about this old, old Belarusian people's assembly, so that even if Lukashenko will be likely elected it as its own head, this party is uh, this this new assembly will uh, have to form a type of a Politburo, which will have to control the uh, the president at least uh, uh, at least formally. Uh, and uh, we can always get back to that later in, in to discuss the elite in more detail. Uh, but uh, the final cluster is obviously. The, uh, Belarusian relations with Russia because what we see after 2020 is that or rather after uh, 
22 is that the old model of Belarus Russia relations is totally destroyed. So, this is something that actually is a part of uh, recently co authored uh, edited volume with my colleague Arkady Moshes. But what we discussed there and what our authors talk a lot is that, uh, not only talk but also show, is that uh, basically this old model has been, uh, has been pretty much ruined. So, uh, we don't really see at the moment the emergence of a new one necessarily uh, for simple reasons that uh, for, for Putin and for Russia uh, Lukashenko is kind of doing what they want him to do things work smoothly, attention is elsewhere why actually start this right now while well, we can actually focus on other things so, but, but the point that uh, the model uh, is in a sense is no longer functioning and has been substituted by a type of a Lukashenko-Putin romance shows that uh, we actually have a quick potential for, uh, for change in case Russia decides at some point that well it's, it's time to, to actually substitute that and we do show that uh, in, in many, uh, many areas such as for instance foreign policy one argument would be that this model, model is no longer functioning because uh, the Belarus-Western relations are totally ruined uh, and are incurable under mm -hmm. Lukashenko. And this Western direction or West has been always an important bargaining tool for Lukashenko to, to actually check on any Russia's attempts to revise this model. And also, uh, obviously, the cases where we do see not only the new type of economic relationship, but also the fact that in many other areas, be it, for instance, media, we have full synchronization. Uh, in uh, military direction, we have actually a case of subordination of Belarusian military uh, to Russians. And obviously the case that we actually see um, Moscow's new type of a presence, meaning that we have nuclear arms. Uh, we have uh, constant present of presence of uh, Russian troops. Doesn't matter where they come and go, but nevertheless, it's uh, a de facto constant presence. And, and 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 the point that if Russia has at least what I would say, if Russia has nuclear arms, which needs to be operated and controlled by Russians, we kind of have a sort of a de facto military base which uh, neither Lukashenko nor the Russian society ever wanted. And uh, probably the final illustration, which is still very telling, is uh, if you look at the way how Russian officials behave in Belarus, I would always compare the current ambassador to Ambassador Babic, who was kicked out in 2017. <coughs> Actually, we see a qualitative difference. So the current one behaves much more, uh, I would say, aggressively compared to Babic, and there is basically no repercussions for that. So he behaves like, you know, uh, uh, I would say mimicking the, um, uh, mimicking in a sense Lukashenko going around the elite, having the, his own narratives and uh, uh, constant contact with the officials and having his own agenda in a sense. So that uh, something that we would always, I would give an example, uh, the invitation of uh, uh, Pushilin to, to Belarus in 2021, uh, organized by Russian embassy uh, with uh, basically without uh, any any ability of Minsk to, to say no. And having said that, I would quickly move to to where we are now in a sense and uh, where this can lead us. So in a sense, quo white is Belarus. And um, I would underline a number of things. First of all, we do right now see a sort of an argument uh, on the evidence of mostly this year that the regime has stabilized uh, domestically, sort of a repression spork, but also that one may argue the regime has found a new type of a, uh, let's call it legitimization tools in, inside the country, meaning that the fact that it sells the peace and the uh, non-participation in the war to some part of the Belarusian public as the regime's 
uh, achievement, it kind of works. Uh, the same comes with the, obviously, uh, besides uh, this peace agenda, uh, inertia in the system, we still see that uh, the elite still kind of finds out what these new opportunities are and how actually this may work and uh, takes their steps quite, quite, uh, um, quite cautiously, let's put it this way. And um, the fact that, in a sense, uh, the demobilization tactics as such, and I'm not talking about the Lukashenko's opponents, but actually also of the regime supporters. Like, the regime actually does try to prevent any type of a rise of any kind of a grassroots popularity, even among people who sort of promote the regime agenda. So that uh, the case is always quite a good one. Uh, looking at the pro-regime bloggers, uh, we would have a wave of arrests, or the, let's call it detentions, of these bloggers to actually make sure that they uh, stop growing their channels. By one mean is to stop getting uh, donations and uh, sponsorships, so that you know we, we don't want any type of potential bottom-up challenge. Uh, and obviously, the case that uh, again Moscow continues to deliver resources, uh, and uh, the Belarus quite uh, quite well benefits from the military conference. So any type of a military cooperation with Russia, uh, Russia's military budget, part of it actually uh, goes to Belarus and supports its, its economic growth. The question though is that, uh, so in, in this regard one may argue that uh, Lukashenko becomes really a benefactor of, of the war and more importantly the stalemate of the war. The question to me is that nevertheless we have uh, quite a number of important elements which uh, uh, show that uh, this is uh, fully unsustainable. On one hand, and this is something that clearly is uh, sort of a common sense, uh, this very much depends how the war goes, right? So in this regard, any type of a, um, let's say, change in the war dynamics, let's say, to the negative for Moscow, meaning that there is a mounting pressure on, on, on Putin uh, to actually cut the support to Minsk, or there is growing pressure from Russian elites to actually revise this type of a um, status quo, uh, would quickly uh, basically put the regime under such pressure that it's probably unlikely to, to sustain it. But the same comes with the idea of uh, this temporary uh, um, utility of the Lukashenko's peace agenda. In essence, even if we see that uh, Belarusian, some of the Belarusian public obviously uh, feels uh, relieved that what they would say there is war somewhere and Belarus is no part of it, so closing eyes on the reality. We still see that we have a profound disjuncture between public opinion and, and Lukashenko's regime. So that we still, and that actually distinguishes at least my interpretation of uh, uh, this perennial question whose war it is. And in case of Belarus, clearly we see that this is obviously Lukashenko's war simply because uh, no matter how trustworthy we find the polls which are done now in Belarus, we do know that it's practically uh, like over 90% of the public do not support uh, do not support any type of participation of Belarus in, in this war. And this even comes to cases where we actually have regimes attempts to um, to sway public opinion in certain cases, be it the stationing of the nuclear arms and uh, the presence of Wagner. So we see a lot of lobbying, a lot of promotion of how this actually can benefit, and we still see that the public totally rejects that. Having said that, we do see that uh, the society is divided. Uh, the society is as, and I would say this is not a unique case, in, if we uh, look at uh, this polls done, even if I would be somewhat, although I'm not an expert, uh, skeptical to how uh, how far we can generalize this this 
findings, we still can say that um, the Belarusian public is uh, totally divided on uh, uh, and actually key questions who's followed this, you know, who is the main culprit of why there is uh, uh, the war going on, uh, is it Putin's fault or is it the Western fault, and so on and so forth. But if you look at these numbers, uh, we do, don't see much difference to, let's say, what uh, the uh, Moldovan public opinion is. Uh, and in this regard, what at least brings us to, uh, to a positive, because I can say that my talk is like a Verdi opera, you know, it's just going on. <laughs> uh, so somebody should be burned at the end, uh, the main character. But we still see that um, the society and the regime has a tremendous gap in what they view uh, Belarusian's future. The regime is ready to save its own future at, say, at the cost of the sovereignty and statehood, we do see that the public has uh, actually quite a full uh, support pro-independence, pro-statehood. And the same comes, I'm coming back to, the causes of the Belarusian uprising, the same gap between the state and society when it comes to specifically the value agenda, is basically, uh, as wide as the sea. So in this regard, we do come back to a question that Belarusian society, to a large extent, is European in its values, right? Uh, regime tries to impose something else on it. And the problem here, and I'll make a little bridge to, um, as Belarusian would like to talk about bridges, but um, a little bridge to what the West can and should be doing. Uh, the question is that, in Belarus, these values are not seen as European, because there is very little knowledge of what Europe is. And for them, it's, 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 uh, uh, and it's not only about knowledge, but also about trust issue. So Europe was always absent, and uh, very much European messages due to the fallacies of how, in my opinion, this normalization with Lukashenko worked previously, uh, Europe's outreach was also going through Lukashenko to Belarusian society. Like a good example is that uh, none of the civil society organizations in Belarus could actually get Western funding unless they are cleared by by, by the regime, and that was the uh, this was accepted by the EU. So the the West actually in the EU has quite a good potential to uh, to reach out or at least to explain why. Uh, why Belarusian society actually is better off in, in a, with, with Europe, in a sense, when there will be a moment of a chance to do that, and equally to the Belarusian elite. So we clearly have very little knowledge about the Belarusian elite since uh, since the beginning of this regime. So we have a lot of kind of a circumstantial evidence, but we can actually say that at least to from at least accounts and policies before that there is there is. Uh, obviously, uh, an elite which potentially can be influenced, or at least the elite, at least mid-level, that can be explained that why uh, independent Belarus, which might uh, decide to integrate with, with the EU, has, is, is better option than integration with Russia. Because Russian offer is on the table. Everybody knows how actually you will benefit or what your future might look if you become a Moscow bureaucrat. So you might be lucky enough to end up in Moscow, but in the end you'll have your job and it doesn't matter whom to serve as long as there is uh, peace and you get your uh, uh, your kind of a funding. So in this regard there is a lot of potential and the problem is that much of this is today thought to be done by the Belarusian opposition, something I didn't talk about much for a reason. Uh, that explains my position on their capacity to, to actually influence right now. And the Belarusian opposition is clearly going in the opposite direction to what Belarusian society inside the country is. So this is another topic, another story, but uh, the Belarusian opposition doesn't even try to reach out to the public inside the country. And the West, or at least the EU, to a large extent, thinks this is uh, this is uh, the job of the opposition, that's why you know, we don't need to do much. So we kind of end up in this kind of a conundrum at the moment. And uh, as my final point, and then we can move to Q&A, it's uh, 
in the end of the day, even if the, I would say, regime is fragile, uh, we come back to a question that its future and the future of the Belarus as a sovereign country will very much depend on the outcome of the war. So we have a case where only Russia's defeat might give Belarus a proper chance to actually also decide its own future, whereas Russia's ability to come out of this war undefeated, uh, meaning that it will have attention and time to decide or move on its plans is of Minsk, which will be decided closer to, to the day when it's probably will be due, uh, will uh, put the Belarusian sovereignty in mass danger simply for one reason. Um, even if Belarusian public is so much pro-sovereignty, pro-independence, I think the clear message that Moscow sends to the countries in its neighborhood is that if you want to go against our will, uh, you know, the best case scenario or what well, worst case scenario, I don't know what they would say, is that you will see the same uh, massacre you're observing in Ukraine. So also on another positive note, and uh, thank you for this, and happy to hear the criticism comments. Thank you very much. Thank you for that talk. You covered a lot of ground, and I'm sure there's a ton of questions from the audience about various points that you made. Um, as a political scientist, I wanted to start with the idea of repression, and you kind of reemphasize its importance in stabilizing the country after 2020. But what are the long-term effects, and how has the regime come to terms with the pros and cons, or costs and benefits of this more repressive apparatus? And how is the public acclimated to the post-2020 violence? Um, is repression now the, 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 the lay of the, of the land? Um, is it creating more enemies or more fault lines or dimensions? When, when the regimes consolidate and, and push in the throat so much more heavily after such cataclysms, it can often spell long-term fissures. Um, and, and, and you can start to see the seeds of their demise when they over, overplay their hands. So I'm curious, are they calibrated correctly? Is this repression equilibrium now are insustainable? Um, or does there have to be a loosening at some point because this, the modernizing society with the values that you cite can't tolerate um, the type of regime that seems to have evolved in the last two, three years? Oh, that's a great question. To a large extent, how this society reacts. We can't really say because um, there is really a real lack of sociological data. Uh, since basically 10 years back, we know very little uh, in comparison, obviously, to let's say countries like Ukraine was actually, or Russia, what's going on there. For me, the question is obviously, um, when it comes to the decision, I think the regime, obviously, if we look at the developments after 2020, came to the conclusion that repressions are the only option. So they've been trying different things, uh, reaching out to uh, uh, basically throwing different options. I, uh, uh, one of their ideas was that, oh, let's have the, what they proclaimed at the end of 2020, let's have the year of national unity in 2021. Uh, like, you know, uh, as one of the steps towards maybe potential reconciliation. When they saw that nothing is working, this year became a year of mass repression because everything was sort of, a, um, uh, kind of cut off and destroyed. The story, obviously, is that if you start with that, and if you see that you can't really grow another leg, meaning that you really can't find how you can actually build at least some partial support in the society, besides these temporal solutions like, oh, we have a peace, so let's stay calm, let's don't do anything. Uh, you have this machinery growing and you can't stop it. Also because if you stop it, and uh, uh, you might actually and up, and if society sees that the repressions are over, you might actually have another pricing because you still have this uh, illegitimate regime, which you know people uh, tolerate only because they are afraid that this will end up, they will end up in jail, beaten, or maybe even dead. So this is something that becomes a vicious circle. You can't stop it, uh, and it will be going on up till uh, uh, the regime has resources. And here we come to something to Russia and to Moscow in 
many instances where I'll argue is that the security apparatus started this only after also a clear tick from Moscow. So we do see that there have been a gap in the elite reaction of what we should do, and only after Putin convincingly came out and said, well, you won the elections, uh, we have full support, they start rolling. So if we'll have a case where Moscow would uh, go against Lukashenko, we actually can see that the apparatus will actually change its uh, uh, will change its quickly allegiance and potentially take uh, take a different approach, but uh, that will also come at a cost to them because there will be obviously, if we anyhow talk about reconciliation between uh, the new regime and society, there will be obviously a demand for uh, some type of a reprimand to at least top figures. Great, thank you. Why don't we open it up? Um, okay, questions. Please introduce yourself before um, you offer your comment. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ailey Feynman from the State Department. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Ailey Feynman from the State Department. Um, so in your talk, listening to your, your really great um, explanation of the situation, there's this puzzle, right, of this country with, as you say, has fundamentally European values, um, and it's modernized and urban and all that, and has leadership and elites who seem completely oriented towards other goals. So one thing that I would love to hear more about is not just the co-optation of civil society that you talked about that happened, but sort of what was the process of co-optation of the population and the sort of economic factors that may have led to this situation that sort of, despite all the differences, seems to point to just like a very deep level of acquiescence, loyalty, being on board, maybe not thrilled, but sort of acquiescence to this. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that process sort of came about and when you see it as coming about in these like, you know, 30 years that, you know, we can now look back on. Thank you. Well, in a, in a simple way, it's basically started in the 90s, that's how Lukashenko actually, in a sense, came to power. And uh, to a large extent, that was, um, so this kind of a, what is called social contract, meaning that you can save your jobs, have your salary, quite decent one, uh, and what you need to do is just not be political. This has been working since till basically financial crisis. Which one? Which financial crisis? 2009, and then what is more important to the kind of a, uh, it had a bit of a delayed effect, you know, when uh, actually in Russia it really took the hit, and then, you know, when. Uh, uh, so basically, it was delayed till 2010, 2011. Since then, we had a totally lost uh, a decade of economic growth in Belarus. And that partially explains why Lukashenko was trying to find different sources of societal legitimization. The question is that, of course, uh, this has been, in a nutshell, has been fueled by Russian money. So this is something that was uh, a blessing for Lukashenko, is that he like for Moscow, Belarus has been always a showcase or a front runner of its regional policies to show what actually good relations with Russia might mean to all of you. So that you know, hey, uh, people in Ukraine who like Lukashenko, if you want the same type of a life, uh, you know, we actually have an offer on the table. So just choose the right people. Or just not choose the right people, don't go against the right people. Uh, so, in this regard, Lukashenko was this kind of a showcase. And uh, the amount of the support, something that is always uh, probably forgotten, has been up to 20% of the GDP. So, like, he got like 100 billion uh, dollars, US dollars, over a decade after the Orange Revolution. So, it's immense money which has been given to him. Uh, as direct and indirect subsidies and then redistributed among the elite and among the society. And again, this has been working up till uh, 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 up till these economic troubles, but even then, you know, he was still trying to maintain it as much as possible um, uh, up till the um, 2020 revolution. But as, 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 alone, as, as alone as the only source of it was never working anymore, so he had to really uh, tap in other other sources of how he can actually um, uh, co-opt the society, meaning that, okay, you know, if you 
we have this awakened uh, uh, and, and interest in uh, and search for national identity. So, like, I, I will just you know uh, jump on and try to be part of that. Other questions? Yes. Thanks, uh, Brian Polk, uh, IFDS, IFS. Uh, I want to ask about a comment that you made towards the end of your presentation about the um, the opposition, the democratic forces, and their influence or lack thereof um, on society. You mentioned it's because they're going in different directions, they're not attempting to reach people. In your opinion, is that a question of messaging, access inside the country where the state is you know, preventing wide distribution of their ideas or discussion about them, um, or something else? Thanks. Well, it's, it's kind of an all of it. In a sense, what is most important in my opinion, is that they are not even trying right now. So the opposition, in a sense, is uh, uh, competing for popularity. It has two uh, two audiences primarily, which is uh, uh, Belarusians abroad, many of whom radicalized. Uh, we actually have to say that uh, Belarusian fighters are one of the biggest constituencies in the Ukrainian army. Uh, for it considering something. Uh, and, uh, and the second one is uh, the EU. I mean, the EU is the largest donor. So actually, what you want to do is that to, when the EU has been geopoliticized so fast, and uh, kind of where it comes, its original policy is either or. You know, you, can't, you can no longer sit on two chairs like many of these uh, countries has been doing to, until 2022. Uh, the opposition done uh, exactly this the case, so they completely uh, now stood in a position not only when it comes to support to Ukraine and uh, against Russia, which is again something that not all of the Belarusian society would share, but more importantly, they would actually go for even as far as NATO membership. And this is something that uh, in Belarusian public would be as favorably viewed as uh, uh, in cooperation with Russia at the moment. So in this regard, you win your votes outside, but then you lose inside. And this is again coupled with the case that they are not really even trying. So all their projects are again oriented to Belarusians in exile. So this is the problem. It's the problem right now. I can't. I can only see the outcome of that in five, ten years when you know uh, the Russian opposition is uh, working at full capacity. Belarusian media are simply reproducing it. Uh, you have uh, uh, you have really characters like we would say like Chernobyl say as uh, propaganda rupers in, in Belarus, and then you know there is basically uh, no. And no supply from the alternative point of view. Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is Nick Castillo. I'm a GW student undergraduate. Um, my question is about a, a long term view of Belarusian sovereignty uh, relating to the union state concept. That sort of gets, it's on the books, by the way, of a treaty from the 90s, but it's received renewed attention since 2020. And then earlier this year, we had this leaked document from the Russian presidential office claiming it was uh, a Russian intention to annex Belarus by 2030. Um, given the state of the regime, but also the state of the population, what do you think the risk is of, a, of in the long term, a formal annexation or integration of, of Belarus into the Russian Federation? And what do you think would be the defining variables in making that likely or not? Well, to me, the case is quite high, and uh, the main variable, like, first of all, with this uh, leaked documents, um, I don't question their authentic, uh, authenticity, but for me the question is that uh, the Russian uh, presidential administration and all type of ministries produce that in mass, you know, so this is papers coming from different corners, there is also a type of a um, inter-agency competition, so this kind of ends up on a, on a table and then it doesn't mean that this is the plan that Moscow would, would actually would use. My point is that this is one of the options and this is obviously something that uh, looking at where Russia, how Russia actually defines its, uh, its goals in Ukraine, uh, where Belarus 
and also other countries like Moldova are uh, in danger zone. The fact that Lukashenko to save his power uh, can't really any longer even show formal opposition to, to Putin is a big danger. Uh, so the main outcome is exactly uh, is the war uh, and to a large extent Russia. So I guess if uh, what I could say, if uh, Russia came, comes out to a certain degree undefeated, I don't want to use the word victorious because that's something that I wouldn't even want to. Uh, it, it, it means that it would still have capacity and uh, for whatever motivation to actually finalize the annexation. And uh, the way how it's going to be done, I think these people are creative, they can find a way. Uh, how it can look, uh, but uh, what we are seeing right now is that this doesn't really need a union state or even some type of a formal roadmap, something that Moscow has been so much insisting uh, for like the previous decade, oh let's sign the roadmaps, let's have this uh, new like uh, supranational package, you know, and uh, uh, let's you know move on with the uh, ruble. They don't need this anymore because now these things like you know the what do you call it uh, uh, the gate is open and this just floods naturally. So we see this intensification just sometimes out of uh, simple uh, uh, simple kind of a um, uh, simple what I can't find the word but uh, but there isn't bureaucrats do it personally does it voluntarily just to show again that to Moscow that hey. Uh, we are actually ready, you know, we are happy to be uh, the ones who will show loyalty early on to be, you know, uh, keep, uh, to reap the benefits uh, a bit later. So that's, that's the problem. And uh, I don't see uh, any other uh, Belarusian society, which is obviously a far-fetched uh, to a certain degree uh, argument uh, as, as the only, and only, uh, only uh, factor that can suspend the stoppies. Thanks, I'm Chris Bort, a former NIO for Russia Eurasia on the National Intelligence Council. Two questions, really. Um, number one, you talked about the Belarusian Russian military basically has been subordinated to the Russian military. But as far as I know, the one thing, and you know, Belarus has been used to launch artillery. Um, it's been used by the Russian military to uh, to move into Ukraine. Has there been the one thing that Belarus still hasn't done is send its troops, actual ground troops, into Ukraine? It's almost like, and that just fascinates me because, like, is this like the one thing that Lukashenko has insisted that he's not going to do? Is like one gift that Putin has given Lukashenko to show that he can still say that he's sovereign. That's one question. The second question is about the Wagner effects. Um, Lukashenko, does he feel like he did Putin a real favor uh, by convincing um, Prigozhin to you know, turn his troops around and, like, uh, and, and then work out a deal? How does that um, factor into this dynamic between Putin and Lukashenko? That's a very good question. In, in short, we can actually bundle them up in the sense that uh, we don't see, I don't see Lukashenko anymore even trying to object Putin. Uh, so he actually is a type of a yes man. So when we look, uh, like they, they probably meet each other more than uh, he, uh, than Putin, his wife, uh, whatever is her name. Uh, but um, and, and we see that Lukashenko is simply is there to get, to listen to a lecture and to you know hail the great man and uh, exactly then thank for whatever is given to him. Uh, so basically, to a certain degree, uh, looks like a Russian governor. Uh, the story with the army and the participation is that I I would say he was never asked, and I would even say Lukashenko was never asked to send the troops to the Russian army. Uh, and I would even say, go further than that, I would say that Lukashenko learned that the Belarusian territory would be used for an attack quite late. So he was like, you know, uh, as the case of Wagner, as the case of nuclear arms deployment on Belarusian 
stationary. That's okay, correct. Uh, on the Belarusian soil, he actually just you know gets the information and has to implement it. This is the case with Wagner. I don't think he was the key. Uh, Moscow really reprimanded him after he was starting going around with his you know uh, uh, fairy tales uh, about how what I've done, etc. And the same with nuclear arms. I, I find it impressive in the sense that. We always get the argument that, oh, Lukashenko has been asking for this. He was asking, saying, oh, uh, give me the nuclear arms and the West will see heaven. Uh, and then, you know, at some point he was told, like, okay, Alexander Vigorovich, here we go. Uh, we are uh, proposing you to station. And uh, what happened is that he disappeared for a week or so from the public space. Because this is something he never, I think, wanted really. Uh, didn't expect that this would happen in uh, 2021. Uh, I mean, the offer. And uh, what is exemplary is that whenever Lukashenko would get something from Putin or from Russia over the last 25 years, that he thought he really loved it and is what he wants, he would be the first one to jump on the table and shout that, hey, what I've done. I twisted their arms. Uh, Putin has to agree with me, and uh, so on and so forth. And here we have a case: you ask for that, and you disappear. Whereas the public, and actually even his uh, part of his elite and media, were like asking the question: What's going on? That's something we don't want. At least that's the public opinion. So he is no longer in a position to have a type of autonomy that he had in this model of Belarus-Russia relations up till at least 2021 and uh, again just needs to show loyalty and even if he is instrumental and helpful be it migration crisis or Wagner or uh, allowing to uh, use Belarusian territory as a plus dorm his uh, own ben my benefit is that okay you know uh, you prove your loyalty and that's why we don't need to look for someone else I think we have time for one more question. A short one. A short one. It's short. It's um. It's also a little speculative. So a short and maybe speculative question. So you talked about uh, within the Belarusian elite there being the pro-Russia and pro-Belarus camps. Is there any sort of prominent elite in Belarus today who is more pro-Belarus than Lukashenko himself? And who? Yeah. Who would those people be? Because it sort of appears that maybe there's no one out there who's more pro-Belarus than Lukashenko himself. Well, that's a good question. I would say that if we twist it around, we can say that uh, uh, even Vladimir Putin is more pro-Belarus than Lukashenko because, you know, he doesn't ask too much, you know, as he could have asked potentially. Because Lukashenko is doing whatever he's asked him, happy to give up. I would say it's, we don't have the pro-Belarus versus pro-Russia. We have actually pro-Lukashenko, mm -hmm. people who stick with him. Right. All the ones who are with him and actually sort of a, uh, just like changing with him uh, whenever he moves. Uh, with the ones who are kind of radically pro-Russian. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the ones who actually say, uh, oh, um, um, let's, you know, uh, attack Lithuania, you know, because they're wild, whatever. So these are the ones who primarily have their audience in Russia. And I'm not even talking about the uh, intra-agency cooperation, because this is something, if we look at the, I don't even know the extent, but we do see that the way how the Belarusian security services cooperate with, uh, with Russians, just to know, uh, it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a new level. So it's, it's relatively new level, and uh, this is where Lukashenko just have to be an observant. He is no longer, even, even, even with, when we talk about the way how he can control this elite, meaning through still arrests and rotation, we do see that he can't touch people who has been so much vocal pro-Russian. And he can't actually, and this is something that I would say, uh, maybe somebody would object, or this is something that maybe can be looked into. If you are before can arrest all this elite for corruption, because you steal from the Russian budget or whatever, but what's the case when you are a direct contractor of Russian railways or Gazprom, so the money don't go anymore through Russian budget? So actually, who will have the uh, legal uh, 
and I guess it's not going to be dollars. So I'll, I'll stop here. It's unanswerable. Uh, well, thank you for, so much for coming. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, we're going to take a little break for New York Voices on Eurasia until next semester. So please join us in January with our, our next guest speaker. Yeah, we needed a long break after to digest <laughs> all the, the knowledge you gave us. But thank you so much for, for joining us, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving break. <laughs>